Hello and welcome to episode 153 of Page One, the Writer's Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And thanks for joining us on the podcast where we like to speak to writers of all kinds about their writing careers, find out how they got into the industry and try and get as many hints and tips from them as possible. And we've had a great uh, array of guests, not only in the past few episodes, but going all the way back to episode one, from crime writers to thriller writers to sci-fi, fantasy, non-fiction. So there's a whole range not of Not a of bad different... episode in there, I would say. Not Absolutely. That's so That's so success. So we say anyway. <laughs> um, but no, we've had some really great guests. No idea why they wanted to chat with us. But, um, <laughs> do check that out. Uh, but uh, we have another great guest this week as well. Yeah, this week we're chatting with the awesome Aisha Malik, who's had, a, a, as always, an interesting route into the industry. Um, she started off working on the other side of the keyboard, or whatever the phrase might be, in um, a publicist for Penguin Random House. Um, so she kind of went in on the other side, saw how the how the how the world worked at, at that end. She did a, a master's in creative writing. She's worked for Cornerstone's literary consultancy. So she's really had a really interesting kind of grounding in what happens to books afterwards or the editorial process um, yeah. before she went down the writing books herself. Yeah, that's right. And and as we'll hear and as we've heard from some other guests recently as well, w- the timing of her finding her success of getting published came when she started writing for herself almost, which is quite similar to uh, the recent guest we had on Ian Green as well. He was the same. Both of them were sort of pushing to write literary stuff because they thought that's what they had to do. But it was when they they decided not to do that um, that they, and wrote something for themselves almost that they enjoyed writing that they found yeah. a success so i think there is a there is a lesson in there oh totally i think you write something that you would want to read and there's always going to be a million people out there, out there that would also want to read it so it's yeah right for you number one for sure yeah definitely and it's a really interesting and fun chat with aisha she she's a lot of fun uh, straight talking there is some swearing warning um, but uh, no, it, it's a really good chat. So we'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook, and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. But for now, on with the podcast. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying, or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project, divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Unfortunately, yes, I do. (laughs) It was one of those things where it was a kind of pipe dream 
and everything was about books and writing and, mm -hmm. and reading. Um, but then, you know, I guess the dream became a reality, um, which is nice to say, theoretically, <laughs> but, you know, um, being a writer is probably not all it's cut out to be. Yeah, we could we could maybe get onto onto that a bit <laughs> later on. But um, am I right in saying that you, you obviously that desire to write led you to do an MA in creative writing, yeah. um, and you were encouraged there to get a job in publishing as a possible to help you become a published author eventually. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the seminars um, that we had, the, the speaker came in and said the best way to get published is to work in publishing so get a job in publishing even if it's as a cleaner so I um I did get a job at Random House and I photocopied their reviews for authors and this is back in the day right so I did photocopy them and then I'd post them off to agents and um, authors dreaming that one day I too would be reviewed in these papers um and that's that's how it began and I was there for two years as a publicist okay. um, which I actually ended up informing a lot of my debut novel um and I yeah it was it was I, I I don't think it was I think it was good advice but I don't think it's kind of categorical you know the, the thing about working in publishing is that you end up meeting people you get contacts mm -hmm. and it's that sort of insider network which is always very hard to infiltrate if you're not in the so-called scene so that mm. made things um very like, not very easy but was certainly certainly helpful yeah and, of, oh sorry no just in terms of finding an agent as well and i was going to say that at the same point am i right in saying you also worked for cornerstones literary consultancy yeah, 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 which, which are pretty good because they're, they're like they were like an editing service and they'll help you get your letters and stuff sorted yeah and so that i guess was the next stage of um my career in terms of learning about actual writing and honing your craft okay so um i left random house because i was there full time i couldn't work and write at the same time i'm just not one of those people i can't multitask um and i joined cornerstones as managing editor um and worked part-time um, and I learned so much through them via the process of proofreading other editorial reports on manuscripts. You know, these are the technical things that you don't necessarily think about when you want to be a writer, like yeah. characterization, pay, mm -hmm. plotting, structure, show, don't tell, that kind of thing, point of view. So this was all really helpful just in terms of my, my own writing. And and so you said that w when you were at... Um, uh, Penguin Random House it was it was difficult for you to actually do your own writing at that time did you I suppose when did you start seriously writing yourself well I think it was tough partly because like I said I can't multitask for shit and partly because <laughs> um partly because at that time I was also under this impression that as a as a South Asian uh, an author a woman of South Asian heritage that I had to write some kind of literary masterpiece mm -hmm. um, that would go on to win the Man Booker Prize or whatever. And um, so in many ways, it was the struggle of not having the time, but also not really knowing what my voice was mm -hmm. um, and not really embracing that. So when I moved to part-time work at Cornerstones, my, my colleagues there were also amazing and they sort of helped me navigate what I should be writing because I'd been working on a novel for like three years and had only written 18,000 words um, and I wasn't able to push past that and you know they were like bin it there's just no point in carrying on if you don't know what to write next and I've always loved Bridget Jones um, I was worked in publishing I used to wear a headscarf and all of these I had lots of Muslim dating stories so I was like oh I'll write a Muslim Bridget Jones that'll be fun <laughs> And so I did. And that's um, that's how I came to find my agent and then um, subsequently get published. So so when it came to that moment and you were like, right, I need to try and find my voice and and, and, and write something. You know, how is that? Is it what is that the case of then? Is it that look, turning to what you know, you know, writing about what you've experienced? And is that what really helped you get past that point? I think what helped me was letting go of this idea that you have to be 
literary just because you're brown and this was like this was almost 10 years ago now right so the conversation has moved on from there so much but I was sort of trapped in that idea um and um but as as to writing what you know I think it's it's not imperative. I think you should write whatever you want to write about. But for me, writing what you know lent itself to me being able to kind of be quote unquote authentic mm -hmm. and write about um, things that I'm interested in and um, things that are kind of entertaining, funny, but also um, social issues, which I wanted to explore via the medium of this comedy really romantic comedy um so it was a sort of combination of of these things um but I do think that writing what I knew as a debut author freed me up from that sort of anxiety of oh shit am I getting this right do you know have I done the research right here because you know it was all it was all it all came from um quite personal experiences was that vastly different from those 18,000 words that you Oh my God, so different. Those 18,000 words were shit. <laughs> I'm so happy they went in the trash, honestly. <laughs> was that kind of, you know, when you start writing, you're kind of self-conscious, you, you want to be literary, you want to beautify your writing. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, and it, it takes away from that kind of... Um, from, from that authenticity, but also when you try too hard to write a certain type of book, it's just not going to work. You know, mm -hmm. you have yeah. to, finding your voice is a really elusive thing. Um, and, you know, I teach it as well, but it can't be taught. It has to be done via practice. And that includes reading and learning about what your um, abilities are, but what your limitations are as well. So, um, yeah, that find, finding your voice um, is, is imperative because that's also the thing that stays with you or rather um, becomes a part of who you're known as, um, mm -hmm. as, as an author, uh, your voice and your style. And actually, that's the style, style is also something that's really important if you want to build upon a sort of readership and your brand. I hate using that word, but you know what I mean, brand. Yeah, so so once you'd once you kind of found your voice and you'd written this book what was your next steps and you wanted obviously you 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 got an agent yeah. um and was that was that helped then by the by the job that you'd had at uh, had penguin random house it had well it was by being with cornerstones actually because okay. they looked out for agents and so um they set up a meeting with my current agent nell andrew and I met her and she was an associate agent at that time. And I just loved her. I thought she was great. She was dynamic. She was fierce. Um, she, you know, she just, she just knew her shit. Mm -hmm. So I was like, that's, that's the woman I want to represent me. And so I was um, in the fortunate position of being able to send her very rough um, first 30 pages of what I was working on. And I said, I'm writing a Muslim Bridget Jones. Here are the first 30 pages when I'm done, would you like to read more? And she said, yes, absolutely. So when I finished, I sent her the revised manuscript and um, yeah, and um, she she loved it and I signed up with her and the rest is history. So, so you didn't have to go through that three chapters and no a hundred submission letters and stuff like that. No. So, I was, yeah. I was, I was very lucky in that sense. Well, you're lucky, but I suppose you'd also spent two years or so or plus you know, creating that opportunity, you know, to be in to, to for that meeting to take place and stuff. Yeah, and, you know, yeah it's you know, it's it's a hustle, right? Yeah. And yeah. you have to in many ways, you know, we think of a, a writer's life being quite dreamy and abstract and sitting in your room and, you know, reading and writing. But actually it's it's it is a real hustle and you've got to be you have to be quite calculating at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. as well as tenacious. And so, yeah, you, you know, it's important for you to think about why you're making the moves you're making and how that's going to lend itself to opening up career opportunities for yourself. Yeah, definitely. And, and that first book was called um, Sophia Khan is Not Obliged. Yeah. And you can, you've used the phrase a few times now, Muslim, Muslim Bridget Jones, which is a really, I mean, that's a really great, like, snapshot, you know, comparison pitch. Yeah. What, I don't know what I'm trying to see here, but, you know, it's, it's a... It's, exactly logline yeah and and that's something which i know publishers are really keen you know they want to know that it's something snappy yeah, you, you, you know what it means yeah. and where it sits in a shelf straight yeah. away and that's and that's a perfect setup for it i think isn't it 
Yeah, they love an elevator pitch. And actually, it's also a useful tool as a writer to know what your story is. Like if you can distill a 90,000 word novel into a sentence, then it also helps you focus what you're writing. Because when you start, you know, it's 90,000 words, sometimes you lose sight of exactly what you were doing in the first place. And so that actually that elevator pitch can be really useful. Yeah. So, so did uh, that's interesting. I mean, did you have that elevator pitch before you even started writing it? Then that was the yeah. The I was like, I'm, oh, I'm just going to write a Muslim Bridget Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> it kind of came to me, so I, I so I did. Um, and yeah, some people um, sort of take umbrage at the idea that it's called a Muslim Bridget Jones because they think it's pigeonholing. But I conceived of the idea like that mm-hmm. because I was a Helen Fielding fan. Um, and because of the whole USP being a main character, it's a hijabi Muslim practicing protagonist. So, um, so yeah. And, and once you had that kind of log line of a story, you know, this kind of outline of, a, of, of what kind of book you wanted to write, how do you go from there? And what came first at that point? Was it the character or was it the plot? Where did you go? Yeah, no, I think it was definitely the character. And she sort of spearheaded the the, the story, um, and subsequent books. I think I've thought of the idea before I've thought of the main character. But with the first book, I think because it felt quite uh, close to home, it was very much the character and the voice that came first. And I remember writing it, and fifty pages on, I was like, "Oh shit! Actually, that plot doesn't work." Um, but instead of going back and revising it, I just carried on writing and finished the draft. But so the plotting sort of came in dribs and drabs um, through her sort of emotional journey. So, I mean, what is your process now? And it sounds like it's changed a bit from from previously. I mean, are you are you in the planning camp or are you in the pantsing camp? Oh, I'm definitely. I used to be in the pantsing. I started off in the pantsing camp and it's pants. I went into the planning camp and I'm a huge believer now in just spending time thinking about the story, making notes, reading, researching, listening um, to podcasts, anything that might inspire you. And actually then taking all this stuff and trying to um, plot a story and figure out what the narrative arc is going to be. And those... um, Pacing is pacing. I find quite tricky, actually. Yeah. And in all my books, I think there's there's always been a sort of criticism about the pace being quite slow. And so, with every book, I'm making concerted effort to try and really pinpoint where those conflict points are in the story. And I guess I take a much a, a, a more kind of objective look at the story. So there's the whole part of the process, which is about things that you're interested in, the things that you want to explore, the mm-hmm. themes that you want to explore, what you want to say, what you want your reader to feel, but also yeah. there's the, you know, there's the professional side of it in which you need to think, okay, technically speaking, how is this book going to work and what is going to keep the reader engaged? And that is always conflict. And so, um, so I find planning that beforehand really useful. Um, and it doesn't always, I don't always stick to plan. In fact, I, I probably haven't um, since that since I've started that way, but um, I do find it useful um, as a foundation because then also you're not facing the blank page every day. Yeah, because yeah. you kind of have an idea of what you want your character's journey to be and what you want to happen in the story, and so at least you have something, even if it's even if it's crap what you're writing, at least you know it's serving the story in some way. Yeah, it's it, with with the pan when you didn't do that so much. What was the issue with it? Was it that was it that blank page every day? Was it that you had written yourself into corners and had to sort of fix things afterwards and things like that? And maybe it was a combination. I think it was the it was probably the blank page as well, but also just having to revise mm-hmm. the first draft of a story that is just kind of all over the place, mm-hmm. and it shouldn't be because. I mean, theoretically, it shouldn't be because it's a straightforward, linear sort of rom-com. But when you're making plot changes, if you've if you've written a decent, halfway decent novel, then all that seeding in that you've done, you then have to rejig. Yeah. So it just becomes a bit of a minefield. 
Um, and I think that for me, structuring beforehand, again, like it doesn't have to be structured right to the end. It's just having an idea of what those key sort of conflict points in the story are going to be, just to help um, to focus the narrative. And um, yeah, and then hopefully it doesn't mean I have to go back and redraft a hundred times. And, and did you find that when you switched from the pantsing first novel to the planned subsequent ones, did you ever find that having the plan took away some like spontaneity or, or enjoyment in terms of, you know, you, was it planned to the point where you kind of like, it was almost boring or, or, or did you like having that certainty? And that's a, no, that's a really good question. I don't think I always stuck to the plan. So um, if, if something happened in which, and I'm sure it did, and I just have a really crap memory, so I can't remember right now, but if um, if the story was going in a place that I hadn't planned, I just sort of let it go there and went with it. Um, so I think the good thing about structuring is, is it gives you an overview, but at the same time, you're not wedded to it. You know, yeah. if it's not working, then bin it, it's fine. Um, but at least you've taken that time to understand what is necessary in those certain moments in order to keep the, the sort of narrative drive going okay, yeah. um so yeah because you don't I I wouldn't plan uh, my story to an absolute team each chapter is literally just a couple of lines as to what's going to happen mm. but it's not paragraphs and paragraphs and certainly not pages because that I think really takes the spark out of it and mm. takes the spontaneity out of it um yeah and on the process now that you have so you've got this plan which you may or may not um, stick to closely but does that lead to a cleaner first draft and do you revise as you go or do you get to the end and then revise it's a bit difficult to say marco because when i really started structuring it was probably for my third novel maybe to some extent in my second novel because it was a sequel third novel and I just kind of got bored of um, structuring so after chapter six I was like oh sod this I'm just going to start writing I know enough and so um I did end up revising that book quite a lot and then the fourth book that's just come out the movement there's my plug um <laughs> I am um, it's a very complicated book and it's a structurally very complex book and so even when I structured it um, my editor kind of looked at it and she was just like, okay, this isn't really working and you're going to have to restructure it. So I say so I did a bit of that. But then when it came to writing it, because it was, it's such a complex book to write, it was, I don't, I think the structuring definitely helped, but I would have had to, I probably would have had to revise it a lot more had I just, you know, started yeah. without any yeah. plan ahead. And what about editor's notes? You know, is that something which you quite enjoy getting back or is it something which you kind of dread a little bit and is it is it helpful? Well, you you know, when you're waiting for your editorial notes, you just kind of want your editor to be like, oh my God, I love this. You're the <laughs> best writer I've ever met in my life. Um, so you do want them to be kind of effusive. But I, I love working with the, my editor. Um, well, my ex-editor now, but I think it's a really valuable relationship and I, I've i enjoyed sort of being guided with her by her so much because she sort of understands what I'm trying to do and she, um, she tries to help me navigate that in a way that keeps true to what I want, but also, you know, means that I might have to make some, some changes. Um, and I think editors are amazing because they they take something, they take an idea or a piece of work um, that might that might be working, but just, you know, it needs tightening, it needs, um, it needs better character development or whatever it might be. So they give you that sort of objectivity um, that you don't have when you're writing, because mm -hmm. I edit as well, but I can't edit my own books for shit because you don't have that objectivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I love, well, I don't love it when I get like pages and pages and pages of notes, but um, it's it's nice to have that guidance because also part yeah. of writing is also second guessing yourself, right? And doubting whether something works or not. So to have someone say, yes, actually this works really well, or maybe this isn't working so well is very useful. Well, I, I was going to ask about that. I mean, you touched on it there, obviously your experience at, at Cornerstones and you said uh, you still edit and stuff like that. When you're actually writing, 
I appreciate what you said about it being difficult to be objective with your own work, but do you ever think about, or, or how much do you think about that sort of technical side of things when you're actually writing a scene or something like that? Yeah, no, I do think um, about the technical aspect a lot more than perhaps I did when with my first book. Mm-hmm. Um, because like I said, things as simple as conflict, you know, that's, if it's not, if it's not there in a scene, then what's that scene doing there? Yeah. Um, and am I, I mean, I do end up telling quite a lot in my novel, not novels, but, um, I think that's okay. If you have to tell, you can't show everything, but it's about that balance as well. You know, where do you, where should you be showing and where should you be telling and, yeah. um, and the sort of. The technicalities of seeding in information where and when and um backstory and flashbacks so i do yeah i do take a bit more of an analytical approach is that something that sort of comes through more in when you're doing a, a, a second or third draft or something think, like that yeah i think so because like i said i'd always i try to write the first draft just as it is and I always say to the students I teach, just accept the fact that your first draft is going to be shit. That's fine. That's what editing is for. And so much yeah. of writing is editing well. Yeah. So um, yeah. as long as you have that foundation, you've got to the end point, then there's no, there isn't that sort of, oh my God, I'm never going to finish this book feeling. You finished it. So now you have to do the work to make it the best possible manuscript yeah. it can be. I, I always think the first draft is, is the hardest because it's just, it's that, You've nothing to work with. You just you having to put it all down, and and you, and it's yeah those doubts are you know they're just in the back of your head saying this is just just garbage. Just just give up. Just chuck it. Start again. It's crap. But and and you have to push through that. And then as you say, once you have it, you can then work with something. And, and the, at least you've got something, even if it's shite. You've got shite. You can then mold into gold. <laughs> that's, exactly. that's, the, that's my plan. Oh, um, gold. <laughs> I'll so just i just paint it yellow and it's close enough. <laughs> um, now you you mentioned it earlier on there, but your latest book is the movement. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what that's about? Okay, um, so the story is about a female writer who's up for a very prestigious award, um, and she's very tired of all the social noise and opinions that uh, have been sort of been going on um, throughout her literary career and she feels like um, everything is just um, laden with polarization and too much opinion and too much noise and she just wishes everyone would shut the fuck up and so one day on the day of the award ceremony she decides to take her own advice and she shuts the fuck up and she takes this vow of silence which then ends up catching fire sort of globally and creates a movement of people who begin to call themselves non-verbals and the world becomes um, fractured into these two camps of verbals and non-verbals and under the umbrella of this sort of non-verbalism economic and social structures begin to crumble and it's you know it's really a look at kind of how we live today but also what does it mean to have a voice and what should it mean and what are the you know what are the what are the positives of silence and how should we navigate this need for us to give our opinion um and what is it lending to sort of social development and social progress so it's um yeah that's that's where it begins nice. i mean that that does sound quite an ambitious novel in the sense of you know thinking about what would happen in that situation did do you spend a lot of time doing research into that sort of thing i did yeah i spent a lot of time reading um around um concepts of silence i took a vow of silence for a week myself much to wow. pleasure of my family and friends <laughs> and i also yeah um i I, yeah, I did a lot of I did a lot of research, and it required a lot of thought in terms of technically how I was going to structure this book and what I wanted this book to do. And some of it was in my control, but some of it was just like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to stick that in. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to stick that in. And suddenly, I had like this book that was almost unmanageable um, from my perspective, um, which is where my editor was incredible. Um, but yeah, no, it spent, I spent a good three or four months structuring that novel because there are three main narrative strands, three yeah. main characters. Um, and this, 
and the, the timelines are different as well. And um, I use documentary snippets and articles and tweets and all of that business just to, because it, in some ways it might, it might not have been necessary, but it had to contribute to the themes that I was looking to explore within the novel. And so that sort of haphazard nature of timelines and various um, social media platforms was kind of necessary to to the story that I was writing. I mean, I mean, four books in 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 four years, and 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 it sounds like it's quite a departure from your first book in a lot yeah. of ways, you know. And do you think is that still something you're still trying to nail down exactly what you know what type of book or stories you want to tell or do you quite like being able to just you know have the variety and branch out whenever you feel like it i quite like the variety you know i like the idea of not having to stick to one sort of quote unquote i've used quote unquote like three times <laughs> almost as pretentious as just pretentious as using air quotes um um i, I don't i don't like the idea of sticking to a, a sort of genre in terms of like, I wouldn't write sci-fi, but one of the good things is that, you know, I've, I, I wrote a rom-com, which is great fun. I wrote its sequel, which is fine. I wrote my third book, which is a kind of social satire. Um, and this book, I guess, is also a social satire, but with a much darker and ambitious outlook. Um, and I like the freedom to be able to do that. Um, with, on the flip side, if you're not establishing yourself as a certain brand of author, then that can have an impact on just what your readers are expecting. Yeah. Okay. So um, I I love the freedom to be able to do that, but it perhaps isn't um, the most sensible of um, decisions to make um, because as you know, in the publishing industry, we like to sort of put things in neat little boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're constantly, if you're kind of moving in and out of that box and the booksellers and readers aren't quite, publishers aren't really sure where to place you, then that can, that can be problematic. Were you ever advised that you should stick to writing rom-coms or, or something rom -coms like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I only really had one rom-com in me. So if, even if I was told to stick to it, I wouldn't have, I, I mean, how many... I don't know how many romantic comedies can you write? Like I can't write more than I couldn't write more than one. Um, so no, I was never I was never told. And I think also because my third idea about building a mosque in an English village was so topical, and it's been called a Brexit book, which it wasn't intentionally. You just mm -hmm. just you know you kind of um, absorb your social atmosphere, don't you? When it comes yeah. to writing. Yeah. Um, and because my publishers loved the idea so much, I don't think they really cared. It wasn't another rom-com. They were like, actually, this is a great idea. Go for it. And the same with the movement, the idea of a, a woman taking a vow of silence and then this becoming a global movement. Um, you know, my editor loved the idea so much. She was like, absolutely right it. And obviously that first book that you had all the time in the world to to yeah write it and perfect it and stuff and yeah. having written these books now in in quick succession is it is it harder to do that do you find the the time pressure quite difficult to to deal with yeah i find it difficult also because if you're not a strictly mass market commercial writer and you're writing um commercial with literary crossover um genre then the space to think about what you're writing is really important. Mm -hmm. And I have a target generally when I'm under contract, I have a target of writing a thousand words a day. Um, but I need that sort of space and that time to really think about the story I'm trying to tell, you know, what do I want to say? How do I want to say it? And you can't, you can't do that if you are under time pressure. So, um, so with the movement, I think I was uh, lucky because I had a bit more time to sort of um, really think about that. Um, but I, I, yeah, I might just need a bit more time for my next book because I don't, I just don't think it's a good idea to rush the books that mm -hmm. you're trying to write if it's not, if it's not mass market. Yeah. And as well as writing your own books, you're also a ghost writer, which I, I believe is not a horror 
<laughs> dead person coming back to write books but you've also you've written books for Nada Hussein yeah uh, how does that come how did that come about and what does that mean that was that was a while ago now um yeah publisher approached my agent and they were looking for someone to ghostwrite these um adult fiction um novels ideas that Nadia had and um yeah I, I went with it and um it was a it's a kind of a seamless process we sat and we brainstormed ideas for the book, um, characters of what she wanted to say, what she wanted to explore, the subjects that she wanted to um, talk about. And then I was given a storyboard, um, which is essentially a sort of a, a, the structure of the novel, what would happen in each chapter and how the story storyline would go. And then I just wrote it. And I think that's also when I became a fan of structuring, actually. I think that taught right. me a lot about the importance of knowing where the story is going mm -hmm. um and i with that with that book i knew what was happening in every chapter and i would write i mean i didn't have a long time to write those books but i, I was writing 2400 words a day wow, wow and i don't remember a day i didn't make target so, uh, so yeah so i mean mentally like we are you in a different headspace then when you're writing I go, you know, because I think you're writing it in the voice of someone else almost, and it, it sounds like is that almost easier? Do you, was that an easier process? I think there's a liberation there because you don't have to give your best lines, so you kind of you're writing for a mass market commercial space, so mm -hmm. there isn't that sort of um, investment in making sure that those sentences are absolutely are beautiful or you know are absolutely necessary I think there's you know there's um there's space for you to be quite objective and also you're not invested in the characters in the same way yes well, so, so I I actually really enjoyed writing all all three of the books and they were fun stories they're about a fun yeah. family and they were kind of light and um had undertones of sort of dark issues um so in many ways it was right up my street um, but no, I, I, yeah, I found it quite, I found it quite freeing writing for someone else actually. And yeah. also if I had any problems like, oh, what kind of drink does she drink? I just drop off an email, you know, what, you know, what, what would this person say or do? And, um, do you want me to do this or do you want me, like, I don't have to make any of the decisions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So all those sort of artistic decisions are for someone else. And then I just, I just do as I'm told. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, having worked at a, a, a um, literary consultancy like Cornerstones, um, are there any sort of key do's and don'ts that you you picked up from from authors sending their things in? Oh, um, don't say that you've written a bestseller and it's going to <laughs> into a film or television series. It just doesn't, it just, it's not charming, you know? <laughs> um, but do be, you know, be, be confident. Um, I, I think rather than do's and don'ts, I think one of the main things that I still sort of um, speak to students about is just thinking about what, what your USP is, you know, what mm. makes why are you telling this story and what makes it different to all the stories that are out there now? And the market is more saturated now than ever. So what's the, what's, why, why should anyone read, why should anyone read this? Um, I think writers are by nature quite narcissistic. So we write with the idea that, you know, we, we should be read, but you have to ask yourself why you should be read. You know, what are you yeah. saying that's worth another person investing time and money in um and i don't i don't know if a lot of writers do that when they're first starting out so do you think it's important for writers when they are starting off that they look with a kind of critical eye at the marketplace and see to themselves where do i fit in you know or where is there a gap because it, you know everyone always says don't chase trends uh because by the time your book comes out the trend's over type thing but but i suppose you that's only kind of half true because you do need to kind of have an eye and know where you would fit in or who you could compare yourself to absolutely absolutely so um like you say trends change and that's fine but you should know who you would compare your novel to which kind of author which kind of author and um 
what kind of style you're writing in, what genre you fit in. I think these mm -hmm. are all sort of basic things that, you, that a writer should know because it helps to focus what you're doing both tonally, but also when it comes to approaching agents and publishers, they want to know, you know, they want to know where you're going to fit on any publisher's lists. So do the, do the research and, and figure out where your story would fit. And you don't, you don't have to know it from the get go, but understanding the, the genre in which you're writing before you start might save you from being in a pickle later. Cause I remember with Sophia Khan, I was, I was writing a rom-com, but I couldn't admit, admit to myself that I was writing a rom-com because I was just being a snob for absolutely no reason <laughs> whatsoever. And the very first piece of feedback I got was from a, an editor friend of mine. And she was just like, yeah, this is so funny. It's great, but just embrace the fact that you're writing a rom-com. Stop trying for it to be different to what it is. Just lean mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. genre. And yes. actually that was the second best piece of advice that she gave me after the whole finish your first draft. Um, and it's when I lent into it that actually I was comfortable to then write the story that needed to be told. I, I found it interesting what you said that, you, you know, you had, you almost had your elevator pitch for Sophia Khan um, before you started writing it. I don't know if that's continued with you, with your other books, but I suppose that would help in the process that you're talking about. If you can sum up your idea in that sentence, even before you start writing it, then that'll give you a good, a good mm. route in. I think so. And actually I've been, I've been lucky because the ideas that have come to me are quite succinct. Um, Muslim Bridget Jones, Mosque in an English Village, Woman Shuts the Fuck Up, Leaves the Clothes on the I mean, it's been quite useful, you know. Um, my next one, I don't know if it is that succinct, actually. So God knows what I'm going to do with that one. But um, yes, it's, it's, it's been useful for me to kind of just um, be able to say what a book is about in, uh, in a couple of sentences. And I think if you can do that, then you probably you know, you, you kind of have a stronger idea of where you're going. Whereas uh, I speak to authors who are like, oh, I, you know, my book's a bit about this and a bit about that, and I want to do this and I want to do that. And you know that there's, it's it's not it's not coming together yet. Yeah. Have you ever um, looked over a submission to Cornerstones and thought that's a great idea and said to the person, this will never work and then taken it <laughs> and stolen it for yourself? <laughs> I can't admit that. <laughs> can I? Um, no, I have. Um, I I have taught students, some of whom have come up with some really stellar ideas, and I've been like, oh damn. Um, but I've <laughs> never, as of yet, stolen any ideas. Um, maybe in the future, I will need to. Um, I've got a few in my bank that I would, just in case. But no, I um, no. Not as of yet. I still seem to be coming up with fairly imaginative stuff on my own, but I mean that might change in the next book with the next book. And and you mentioned at the start uh, when we started speaking that there was, you know, the the life of a writer is not um, perhaps all it's cracked up to be, or all the things, it's all the things people think it can be. I mean, do you want to expand on that a little bit? It's because when you first start, when you're like, oh, I want to be a writer, I want to get published drive towards that publication is so fierce and so dedicated and so involved and then you get published and you're like oh now what okay and I think we really I, this is something also I, I try to tell mentees and any students that think about your career long term it's not just mm -hmm. about the first book getting published yeah. the first book is almost the easiest part it's then sustaining a career after that and you know hopefully getting better and better at your game and um increasing the readership as well as as you evolve as a writer so um that dream of first getting published and thinking that everything will just flourish after that is just i wish someone had told me that was a bit of a you know <laughs> misconception um so yeah it's a it's a it's a struggle isn't it and um i mean it really sounds like you kind of surround yourself in the in the writing world both in terms of your like your job and you've you, you work with writers and I know you've got your podcast with the beer and fast I mean which I imagine is a lot of fun to do and all this all this stuff must help it must help with your own writing just kind of talking to talking to authors and writers 
every day and you know different levels i think so yeah i think it's also because i'm qualified to do nothing else <laughs> i had a dream and i followed it and now i can't go back and become a banker which is what my mum wanted me to do <laughs> um so, but yeah, it's it's a co it's a kind of a constant source of inspiration, I guess, and I think I take it for granted as well because most of my other writer friends have day jobs and whatnot, and I this is this is my day job. Um, so I think yeah, I take for granted just how lucky I am to be surrounded in that environment and you know constantly able to sort of um, have conversations about writing and and books and and stories. Yeah. Uh, and so so what is next the movement is is uh, recently out but what what is in the pipeline the pipeline is my fifth book which i can't really i don't really want to talk about because an author a uh, fairly well-known author once said to me um when you have an idea don't talk too much about it because you lose the spark yeah. when you okay. over, over talk about something um but it will I mean, I'm guessing it will be high-end commercial fiction and it will involve a road trip around America. Cool. Okay. Is it, uh, give us a kind of genre, like a, just like a crime or oh, no. sci-fi? Um, I know it's no sci-fi, obviously. No, but, like, definitely it... not sci-fi. Well, I've been told that crime sells quite well, so I might stick a murder in there. Just nice. Quick. Cool. Yeah, you know, why not? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> the last book that you're in the last book that i read well i'm reading giving up the ghost by hilary mantel oh yeah okay memoir. um because when she died i felt really sad that i had never read any of her work no, um, i haven't read any of her stuff either. so i i'm reading that which i'm enjoying i'm also listening to a non-fiction book called bittersweet by susan kane which is very good and a sort of investigation into um sort of a melancholic dispositions when we live in a world of toxic positivity so that's quite light <laughs> um, and I finished reading Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead which was just oh it was amazing I loved it all 690 pages <laughs> it was, it's truly it's a truly wonderful wonderful book Excellent. Um, what about the last film that you watched Last film. I don't remember the last film I watched. I'm right now. I'm obsessed with rewatching Suits. Can I just oh, like yeah. I say, Suits is just full of everything anyone needs in a drama. It's <laughs> funny. It's dramatic. It's pacey. It's got some of the best one-liners, and it's got Harvey Specter. But <laughs> Suits I'm, is a show I've never, I've never watched. It's, uh, I know, well, and everyone, I know it's massive, but yeah, I never, I never watched it. Legal dramas generally are really fun are great but yeah. uh, this i think is is just really fun and funny and full of heart and slightly i mean slightly overworked at times but i think it's it's good i'm quite interested in screenwriting so i think it's a good um series to watch to learn as well about kind of editorially what you what you might want to do with a script is that something you'd like to move into yeah potentially i wouldn't mind giving it a go I have no experience in it but yes i'd quite like to excellent um and yeah Tarek the last thing oh of course Steve, yeah so so the very, very last thing we always do is a uh, super quick fire either or and I always say there's no right answer apart from one but we'll start off with um a beer Mukherjee or Vasim Khan oh a beer obviously <laughs> oh wow jeez sorry Vas didn't even get a didn't even hesitate didn't even a pretend he's, like, thought he's there, not going to be surprised at that <laughs> uh tv or cinema tv uh night owl or early bird Oh, early bird. Um, music or no music when you're writing? No music. And the last one, real book or ebook? Oh, real book. <sighs> Unfortunately, the answer was ebook, so that was incorrect. Oh no! Yeah. Do I fail? Did pretty well though. To them. Do I fail? Did fail? Yeah, that's the only question that actually matters. The rest are just. Don't fun. worry, everyone fails. Tarek. Everyone fails. Yeah. Just, <laughs> maybe Tarek. Maybe does. you failed. <laughs> yes. Well, well, yes. Actually, to be honest, the pro it probably is that because there's about <laughs> six of us have answered ebook, and there's no way we're the six winners. So. Yeah. <laughs> mm, there we are. There's your answer for you. <laughs> That was a really good episode, but uh, 
unfortunate for Vass. He was yeah. Pre previous team. guests of the podcast, of course, are Beer Mukherjee and uh, Vasim Khan, who we had on as a as a double header uh, in one yeah, episode. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't pick between them, so we just thought we'd get them both on. Yeah, on exactly. Aisha but Aisha, who works with them on the Red Hot Chili Writers podcast, was very quick to, to yeah. pick. And the, the stuff she was saying about Vass after we cut was <laughs> exactly. just dreadful. Yeah, we, couldn't, we couldn't record that stuff. We'll have to, have to draw that to his attention, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, thanks very much to Aisha for coming on to the podcast. I thought that was uh, a lot of fun and a, a great chat. And, you know, interesting as well, speaking to someone that's done some ghostwriting as well. Yeah, you we've know, not chatted to many ghostwriters, have we? Exactly, sort of getting the ideas from the person and then turning it into a story but it has to maintain a different voice i guess as well yeah, so yeah it's really quite a fun exercise to do almost. and I'm, I'm, it must be quite a nice way to kind of push yourself as a writer as well because you're kind of forced to do a different style or a different voice that's maybe your own it's quite nice yeah and also definitely. for the person who is the whose book is being written well he's put your feet up and exactly but just maybe do, as we record this today maybe it's not the best time to speak about ghostwriters given what's happening to poor old matt hancock <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be careful who you ask to go straight. Yeah, book. exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, you can pick up Aisha's latest book, The Movement, and her previous books, obviously at your friendly local bookshop. But we'll put a link in the podcast description as well, so you can you can grab those as well. But we've yep. got another great guest next week. Yeah, next week we're chatting with Anne O'Brien, who um, is a prolific writer. She really has done so many books and began in the kind of historical romance genre and is now has now um, kind of created this whole new area for herself in historical fiction, which focuses on women of medieval history who have perhaps not been in the spotlight or, or not been the focus of a, of a story in that time frame before. Yeah, and we speak to Anne about that as well because obviously we've had some other authors like Miranda Mallins, who wrote uh, about Oliver Cromwell's daughter, a, a fictional novel. Um, there, there is obviously a. It's an area that is ripe for exploration. That you know, looking yeah. at women in medieval times who are often so, or, or in historical times who are often so, sort of written out uh, or underwritten, yeah. I guess, in the pages yeah. of history. So there's there's a good. Uh, potential for exploration there so so we we have a good discussion with Anne about that so please do tune in for that one um if you enjoyed today's episode uh, please do take the time to rate and review us on your favorite podcast app as that helps us to continue to get great guests on the podcast well i hope you enjoyed that episode if you did please leave a comment down below hit that thumbs up button and be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like these ones below. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.